Thanks for watching CMTV. We know you'll be blessed by this week's message. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Visit cmjacksboro.com for more information about our church and ways you can get involved. Thanks for joining us and welcome home. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here in the worship center with us. And those of you on Facebook Live, thank you for being here. We've got a very special treat today. If y'all would, go ahead and come put the table and, and chairs out. In the book of Amos, I shared with you last week that God says that he does nothing until he reveals it through his prophets. And I told you, I don't claim to be a prophet. I claim to be a son of God. But God speaks to me and shares things. And last week, I gave you a word that said God says it's time for his church to reemerge. And the church has been delegated as non-essential. And God wants us to reemerge and be essential. And I ask each one of you to pray about that and say, what does that look like for me individually? And as we look at that individually, I believe that we need a strategy how to, to reemerge. And I believe today that, that we've got a guest with us. is Steve Frisco from Muleshoe, Texas. They, they're, they're the pastor. Him and his wife, Robin, are here with us. And they, they pastor a fellowship, I guess, Muleshoe Fellowship there in, in Muleshoe. But in that same book of Amos, and Steve, you'll come on up and take your seat however you want to be up here, however you want this to look like, it's, it's, you can do whatever you want to. But in that same book of, of Amos, he says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? Uh, several years ago, I met Steve and we were on a trip to Washington, D.C. And in that trip, we discovered that God had placed us together and we discovered that we were in agreement on, on, on the Word of God and on the things that God was doing. And so whenever I ask someone here, here to come and speak, I am very particular about who I allow to step up in this platform because I want to make sure that we are in agreement on some of the things of, of the Word of God. And, and I believe that Steve is one of those guys. I believe that he is a true voice of the Lord in the day that we live in today. I believe that he is that prophetic voice. And, and the other night, I saw Steve sit down at a, a bar stool and sit at a table like this there at the, the church in Muleshoe. And he sat down and he said, I just want to share like a father. And, and he, like we're sitting at our kitchen table as he would share with his two daughters. And, and immediately it hit me in the heart because those of you that have followed me and listened to me, you know that I, I had court help me and we wrote a letter to you back a few months ago. And in that letter, I shared that what God was saying to me was everything about the father and that God was expressing himself as a father to his sons and daughters. And that he wanted everything round about me was about being a father that I was to father sons and daughters in, into the kingdom of God and, and into the fullness that God has called them to. And, and so in that, it's exciting for me to know that Steve is going to come and he's going to do that. And so I believe you can learn a great deal through this. I would ask that you welcome Steve Frisco, uh, a very good close friend, and he's someone that I run things by when God speaks to me. I, I, I call him and I say, yeah, this is what I believe God's saying. And he will tell me, I, I believe you missed it, you might need to study some more. Or he tells me, I, I'm in agreement, I believe that's what God's saying. And so I, I am expectantly waiting to hear what he has to say to us through you. Me too. And so you, <laughs> <laughs> and so Steve, please have liberty to share what the Lord has I'm for you. I'm going side with you, big boy. I like that other side. I'm extremely right-handed, like extremely. So there's talking on your phone and trying to back up to a horse trailer at the same time right-handed is hard to do you all know the, you all know the drill but hey the the father thing is 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 huge and what we've started doing the lord really impressed on me back oh it's been several months ago and they're at our own little old fellowship but i've preached on the kitchen table for as long as i can remember doing this because my kitchen table is the most important thing i own most important thing I'm a part of. There's nothing in my life more important than my kitchen table. So I've taught in all our Bible studies and 25 years of doing this now and the kitchen table is highly important. And so one day we put a kitchen table, put a little bigger table than this right there in our little fellowship. And the Lord's kind of been, you know, when you get something, and I want to encourage you this morning, just like Sadie gets a lot of words and then the Lord really speaks to her in dreams and words of knowledge. But 
as, as you get those, grow in them. Don't let those be one moment things. And when the Lord gives you a word, if you hear something today out of me, or you heard something last week from Eugene, just like what Eugene was talking about, the church rising up in this and being revealed and, and uh, in, this, in this next chapter of our lives here in the earth, um, grow in that. Don't just let that be a phrase. Let that be something you grow in. I've been growing into kitchen table ministry now for 25 years. Do a little deal now every morning through COVID. Has anybody here ever watched Coffee with the Colonel? Oh, yeah, we got a couple couple of Jack County guys, <laughs> Coffee with the Colonel. That's, that's all a kitchen table gig. But these words and these things that God gives us, you grow in them. And, and so <clears throat> I've learned now over time that when I used to preach at people, I've been here and preached at y'all. Now I visit with them like a father would. Some of y'all had a father who was either big in the church or high in his religion or maybe just a king of his own making. He was one of those kind that talked at you, didn't talk to you, didn't visit with you. God's not that way. God doesn't preach at people. God will visit with you like a father. And I'll talk to you a little more about that here in a minute because here's the importance of fatherhood. Every one of us, and right now we're getting the opportunity to go through something. We're heading into something that we've never got to do. We've heard about and read about, and it's been a long time since anybody tried it. And uh, we're there. And so we'll see, we'll see how things turn out here over the next 10 days or so again. And we keep having these benchmark moments. Well, we'll wait till November 3rd and then January 6th and now January 20th. And, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hold out till Passover. <laughs> but, but we, uh, here's, here's what we need. We need our Father to give us strategies. So you've been hearing that around here a lot. We need strategies of how to do this. This is what in the past months, when you, what you notice in times of history where prophetic words become very palatable for people, we become very hungry. Because Christians have this innate need to know how it all works out. Our favorite quote is, I've read the end of the book and we win. I got a word for you today. Read the rest of it. Go ahead and read, read the other parts because there's some things that we probably need to do. We need our Father to give us strategies of how you get from here to there. How do I get up in the morning now and go to work? How do, how do I operate? I, I took my phone and, and left it back there in the back room. And honestly, I, I hope it becomes less necessary for me all the time. And I'll explain some of that here in a little bit. But already you noticed in the last 24 hours, some of you that are engaged in the affairs of the land, that your phone has already been monkeyed with, that your information highway has already got a detour in it. And so... Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot going on. So how do how do we survive this? Well, just to reiterate a little, how you learn this. My my strategy is God. I didn't learn while I was sitting in church because I didn't have a church that would give strategies. In Church of America today, there's one strategy: blow some snot, cry some tears, get your name marked in the book, come to church because you're going to heaven. Hopefully, in every community, and I've been doing a lot of work in, in some other states, it's not this way in every community. Y'all are blessed. You have a man and a woman at the helm in, in Jack County. I don't know how many there is. I only know this one. But where they seek the Father, they seek wisdom, they got ears to hear, and they have a willing spirit to share and to give themselves to not only this fellowship here, but your community, your county, and and you got to find that guy. You got to find a guy in these times, and from here on out, from here on out, there's no waiting later. It starts today because you're going to hear this message today. So you'll either start today or you'll monkey around till later. But you'll migrate to, you'll migrate to men and women who seek the throne room of grace, who hear God, who 
expound on the Word of God. Their, their words are factual, they're based, and they come with a strategy for you and your kitchen table. The days of running to a man who runs to his seminary notes is over. The Asher poles are coming down. Those things that we've held in high place, I'm talking about it, and I'm not ashamed of it. I'll take on every one of them that wants to come from Pope Francis on down. I mean, if you're scared of him, buddy, you'd be scared of any boogeyman. They, uh, really, these things that we hold in high places, let's start with political party, because we know neither one of those are any good. Both of them are a teetotal disaster. All the way down to clinging to our denominationalism, where we'll attend a building and really can't tell you why we attend a building that has offered nothing to your kitchen table for the longest time other than a strategy of getting to heaven. Well, once I've told you the strategy of getting to heaven after you die, how many weeks in a row do I got to tell you that one? But I got saved 25 years ago. <laughs> I've been living. And I need to know how to live. And I need, I need to know what's promised me. And I need to know how God is going to show me how to get me and my family through this. I was so proud to hear this morning it snowed in Muleshoe. And so we got some videos. And my daughter was out there. My, my son-in-law had to take off to go do a horse sale in Kentucky. And, and uh, she was out there sledding with the boys this morning a little bit. But she'd already sat them down. One of them's. 11 and one's 14 and she'd sat them down and talk to them about the times that we're going through right at the moment the things that are going on right now because that's her job as a parent to bring strategies and information to your kitchen table not leave it up to somebody else she didn't send them over to my house she sat down and talked with them I remember talking about strategies I was telling Eugene this morning he brought up the father thing when we was praying down there and I remember the last time we went broke, I practiced a couple times so I could get really good at it. When I go broke, I go off a high dive. I don't stop at zero. I just keep on going. We have a saying at our house that the Lord giveth and the feed yard taketh away. But the last time I went broke, I was a saved man. And I remember sitting in my little kitchen bar there. We had a little bar in our house. You remember, Robin, we'd sit down and I'd gotten some pretty rough news. I didn't have enough money to pay attention. And uh, two little old girls, and they'd been living life to the full and we're rodeoing and doing our thing. And all of a sudden, I'm telling you, I don't know how I'm going to buy a horse feed. And uh, we sat down with our Bible as a family. And I told my little girls the situation we were in, my wife and I. We didn't pray for God to fix it. We asked God to show us how to fix it. This was on us. God didn't make me broke. I made me broke. We're so in search of the blessing, sometimes we forget to learn the lesson. I'll probably, I, you know, I'm going to say I'll never be broke again. I hadn't been broke since. The Lord gave me a strategy how to get out of debt. He gave me a strategy how to sew up the holes in our purses. And it didn't happen in 24 hours. It didn't happen in 24 months. Well, maybe it'll pull it off in 24 years. But, but the strategy works. And it came from Father, and the Father shared it with his family. And that's what we did. We began to walk it out and work it out together. That's what we should do as a church. We should come together and walk these things out and work it out together. We should, you know, I'm, I'm game for the days just from Eugene and I were talking about, and that pro prophetic anointing will hit you, and man, you just want to tromp up and down through here, and you want an altar call that goes from here to Walmart, you know, and you, you, you're ready. And then there's times like this where all, all the ears are open, everybody's wondering what's going on, everybody's got their opinion. There's so much bad information out there. There's as much bad information as there is good information. So you better find somebody that can hear from God. 
that loves you enough to take time out to share with you and to help you and to grow in these strategies of God. We've got a couple confusing things. If I was talking to you just like I would my own kids, I'd say, now be careful. There's a couple things you're going to hear out there while you're going to church, and I think I want to help you with that before we get too far down the road because there are some things that can mess you up, and I want you to make either a physical note or a mental note of these things today because these are truths from God. Oh, one thing before I get into these strategies. I visited the council room of God the other day. If you're sitting in here today and you if you've sitting in here and you've listened to Sadie, then, then you've already heard this kind of stuff. There are people out there there's people out there who believes that God's went mute. There's people out there crazy enough to believe that there's no Holy Spirit because the Word of God takes care of everything. I'm telling you, if you'll read the Word of God through the mind of men, you won't meet any smarter than the guy next to you. When you've been enlightened by the Holy Spirit and you've been walking in the kingdom of God in the spiritual realm, you realize and see some things. And I was praying the other morning. I, I, those of you that know anything about me, I'm, I'm on this 24-7. Me and that little gal right over there, this is what we do. We believe in our country. We're patriots. We believe in serving God by serving our kitchen tables, our communities, and our country. We believe in what's been promised us, what's been guaranteed, and we're pretty bent on making sure no numchucks come by and steal it all from us. So we're pretty serious about this stuff. So the other morning I'm praying, just real quick, not in a physical sense, not, not out-of-body experience, but in my mind, the spirit realm, praying in the spirit, I end up in a spot where there's a throne behind me and a guy sitting on it. There's this half moon of, of bodies wearing white robes. And I said, Lord, where am I at? And he said, you're in my council room. Now receive counsel. Come here and receive counsel. I've given you access. I said, Lord, this looks kind of silly. I said, tell me something. He said, just read it. It's Hebrews 12 and Revelation 4. Hebrews 12 says, since we've been surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses. We can run the race with perseverance. Revelation 4 said that I found the door to be open and inside the door was one who sits, and I'm paraphrasing a little, but one who sits as a king on, on a throne and 24 elders dressed in white with crowns of gold. And I said, holy moly, it was very overwhelming at the moment. I've told it a few times now, so Adam's apple is under control. And I said, God, show me. So I'm going to share with you real quick today some couple things that the Lord has shown me that will help you and your family and help this fellowship, help Jack County in the days going forward, no matter what. Because I'm not here to tell you how this turns out. I'm just here to give you an option. But we, if, you, if you fall prey to some bad doctrines, you better be careful. Romans 13, let every soul, Romans 13, 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God that the authorities exist or are appointed by God. So we have been led to believe in the United States of America by church and church people that God picks who's in the White House, God picks who runs your government, God picks your county commissioners. If that be so, then why wouldn't you just bring a list up here and put it on the altar and won't you pray them in the office? Because every one of you know you got to go down there and we used to do it the old-fashioned way where you just count them by hand. You know, you check a thing until the Chinese got involved and now we've got all kinds of stuff going on. You've never driven up to your ballot place and there was a jackass tied up there where Jesus walked in and checked the ballot. The governing authorities came from you, and if you want God, if you want godly authorities in America, then you got to pick them because this institution of government is by the people of the people and for the people. It was all developed under the pretense of God. It was framed through the Holy Word, the Constitution, Bill of Rights, Declaration of Independence, framed through the lens of this Bible. You don't have to be a Christian to live here, work here, pay taxes here, but know this: that it was by divine appointment and by divine inspiration that our three branches of government, which came out of Exodus or uh, Isaiah thirty-three 
23.22 that the judges were across the land came out of Exodus 19. All different places of Scripture where God intervened as a father where He spoke into the hearts and minds of men and brought this thing to fruition. The one constitution on the face of the earth that's lasted 244 years when the average across the globe is 17 years. That institution of government was designed by God. Now you pick the people that run it. And I'd ask for God's assistance while I'm doing that. Children, that's what I'd do. I'd know who was who. And I, you know what else I'd do from here on out? I'd forget which letter they had behind their name because I'm telling you, they've been swapping jerseys while you wasn't looking. And I'd get involved and get engaged. We submit to the institution of our government. What's our government? And if you don't believe me, go read over in 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter talks about the same thing. And the word ordinances in the Bible actually means institutions. So you can go over and read that. But therefore, whoever resists authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. What is the ordinance of God in this United States of America? The Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence. And every, every, every public official that you have selected to operate in your nation, in your state, in your county, in your city takes an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States of America. That means to stay within the boundaries of. To hold it as, as holy ground, so to speak. And when they resist that, when they resist that, they bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not to tear for good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what's good. And you'll have praise from the same. For if he is God's minister to you for good, but if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister and an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Okay, so your governing authorities are supposed to either be godly or they're godless. They're either good or they're evil. How many of y'all know today that we have no other title? There's no other title. You can't do Democrat and Republican. You can't do that anymore. They're either good or they're evil. If, they, they, if they're good, they hold to the Constitution of the United States. They hold to the laws of the land and if they have their own agenda of something else then they step off the bounds and go I've been going to New Mexico now for a long time but I've been helping a lot here lately with these very same strategies us Texans we're still like the old America we're still getting fat and we're still getting lazy you don't have a tyrant for a governor in Texas you just got a guy who doesn't want to govern It's all you got I got it over in New Mexico, they got a tyrant. First seal developed for the United States of America by Benjamin Franklin and the boys said rebellion to tyranny is service to God. Rebellion to tyranny is service to God. What is tyranny? Tyranny is evil. Tyranny goes off the bounds of the governing authority. Tyranny is evil. So when they begin to usurp your rights, and take away the God-given things. I'm just talking about God's stuff. You can't talk about politics up there behind that deal. I'm not doing politics. Politics is what they've been doing while you wasn't looking. But I'll tell you one thing. If I live in a constitutional republic, then my representation should represent my beliefs and be therefore uh, brought forth in policy. My guys should think like me and act like me. And so when they get off of that, they become evil. you got to be careful about evil. Over here in 1 Timothy 2, let me give you a little resume. Or 1 Timothy 1, verse 8. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Look at you, look at you fellowship right here today. we got a little bit of snow going on. I'd like to have a hand count of, of everybody under the age of 60 who decided to stay home because your highway is wet. Or because you've, you're afraid of, of COVID, but you went to Walmart and spent your $600 check you got in the mail on a $598 TV last week. But I'm, just, I'm just talking to you. At least, you know, if you were my kids and sitting in the room, I'd ask you a few questions. You know, what you been doing with your stuff? What are you doing with your time? Where are you at? 
the law is good if you use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless, for the insubordinate. The insubordinate is a person who swears an oath to your constitution and won't adhere to that. He's an insubordinate. Y'all seen any of them lately? Lots of them. They're everywhere. For the ungodly, for the sinners, for the unholy, for the profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers and manslayers, for fornicators, sodomites, kidnappers, liars, perjurers, if there's any other thing that's contrary to sound doctrine according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. So just go down that list right quick. You got people that won't adhere to the Constitution. You got people that are proponents of abortion. You got people that are proponents of unnatural behavior. You got people who live profane lives behind dark doors that sometimes come out in the light for little glimpses. You see how they are. We've got more child, child trafficking human trafficking, all kinds of kidnappers, all kinds of stuff going on. Pornography now comes under the First Amendment that uh, everybody has a right to be as profane as you want to be. You know why? Because when we took patriotism out of our pulpit, we took God out of our politics. We have no righteous plumb line in America anymore because you don't matter. You're a non-essential. You don't matter. The assembly doesn't matter. The assemblies matters. I was just sitting over with Robin a minute ago and it just dawned on me. Look what they've done. Look what they've been able to do with COVID-19, the Wuhan flu, the China virus. Look what they've been able to do. They've convinced you that you can sit home and work in your pajamas and be productive. Guess what? They convinced you you could worship God the same way. I'm going to tell you here in just a couple minutes why this assembly is so important. It is essential and it is the most essential thing on the planet. The book of Hebrews in chapter 10 tells you do not forsake the assembly. But yet you talk about a God who wouldn't forsake you. Now, but look, I'm going to tell you children that why this is not because you have to not because you're supposed to but if you want to save your kitchen table and you want your kids to have a stock show next year and you want to go do your thing this is on you and you've got to adhere to the strategies of God so that you can pull it off the only information highway you have that nobody can take away from you nobody can make adjustments in nobody can tell you you can't have it is the right to assemble in godly assembly. You can cut, you can take parlor off my phone, you can ungoogle me, you can do all that stuff. You cannot, there's not one man on the planet that can do anything to deter my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and remove this word from me. If you burn my Bible, if you burn my Bibles, you can't take the word from me because I've been putting it in me for 25 years. I don't have to have this book anymore. I got it. I don't got it memorized and I have a heck with the addresses. That's why I quote Jesus all the time. Somewhere it's written. But I'm telling you, the Spirit of God lives in me and I've been feeding on the Word of God. I can give good answers to my family. I can come into the council room of God. I can tell who's evil and who's not. Don't you sit over there under your deacon label in your stuffy little old dead in the water church and tell me who you think's godly for president and who's ungodly. Take Joe Biden home with you for a month and see how that works out for you. Get that other one to go with you. You'll be begging for the local police to come get them out of your house. Yeah. I'm just saying. I wouldn't let them ride across the street and pick up with me, but y'all go ahead and do whatever you want to do. I've been in a room with that other. I've been in a room with my president. I'm going to tell you, it's, it's worth being in the room with. You can argue with me. You can cuss me. I've done that a dose of it. It don't matter to me. What I hadn't found is anybody wants to drive over to my little house and just talk about it out in the front yard. 
You're going to have to become fearless. Here's the strategy. Here's what's necessary. First of all, you've got to know there's a government that supersedes all governments for every nation on the planet. If you'll go read in the book of Ephesians, if you'll look at chapters 1 and chapters 2, the Bible talks about Jesus Christ being raised to a place of supremacy. That's the place above all, all things, heaven and earth. All governments, he rules. The Bible also says that as his people, we've been seated there with him. Is that not correct, Eugene? Is that not what it says? Yes, sir. So I, I have that authority and that right. 31 scriptures I read the other day where God said possess the land. You got metropolitan areas across this country, across the state of Texas, who've been telling you what to do and govern things around here that possess people. And they know absolutely nothing about the land. It's like talking about that stock show thing. Man, how awesome is that? Out here in the real America, we're still having stock shows and doing. Caught a real neat lesson yesterday while I was setting at team roping. We went to a little old team roping yesterday morning before we come down here because me and old mom over there, we, we like to mix it up a little bit. We don't win very much, but we like to terrorize the neighborhood. And so we go, and then we've got grandkids and daughters and son-in-laws, and we all do it, so we like to go and hang out with the boys and rope with them. And I was listening to a friend of mine. He's got a son, and they just, if you don't know about team roping, it's sitting in here. I'll just endure me for a second. But the, the header and the healer, and, and so anyhow, I'm, I, I heal for my wife now that we're doing this recreationally because I'm, I'm fairly ineffective sometimes, and I've I've learned there's a lot of timing and a lot of things, and and I get out of time. I'm clumsy back there sometimes, real clumsy. And I got to thinking about that driving last night, how that feels for a Christian that's trying to get in time with God and trying to maneuver and, and sometimes if you're doing it out in public it's fairly embarrassing. I mean yesterday morning I roped the first three in a row just like why wow, ain't nothing to this. Everything's kind of flowing in the right direction. I don't know what I did to get out of time but I got out of time for about the next four in a row and I hit a couple of them right smack in the butt. And it was terrible. It felt terrible. looked terrible. You hate to ride your horse back over to your buddies over here. They just saw what you done. Wouldn't that be a lot like Christianity? And so I was listening to this dad talking to his son. He, he missed one, and then he caught one, and then he missed one. Well, one of them he missed. He rode up there and said, Dad, what did I do? And he said, that one wasn't on you, son. Your, your, your partner did everything he could mess you up. That ain't on you. Here in a minute, he missed a really good one. He come back up there and his dad said, that one's on you. I want you to hear that real quick and let that sink in. There's some of this that it'll be impossible for you to get it right right at the moment because there's other forces involved. It's a very good prophetic word that just dropped in me. And then there's some of you that are getting your walk down to where the timing's getting better all the time. Catching more of them than you used to because you can feel it. You're in the right spot at the right time and the timing is, is good and you're seeing some successes in your walk. When everything's set up just right and you still mess it up, maybe this one's on you. How much of this is on us? You see, we've been led to believe when you just take little bits and pieces of the Bible and don't absorb the whole of the Word, you'll believe something like God is in control and everything happens for a reason. I want you to tell me which verse says God is in control. I want you to show me in the Bible the grand puppeteer who's just operating the earth while we just hang in the wings do you know him as king? Because if you don't, you don't know him. I, these, some of this is a little tough here, kids, but we just will get some of this straight while we're sitting here. You don't know him as king. You don't know him because he's the full meal deal. He's, 
He's the Son of God, the Son of Man, Savior of the word, world, and Lord over all. He's the Creator. For through Him, all things were created by Him and for Him. His name is Jesus Christ, and He's very personal. But He's King. He's sovereign. He rules. Therefore, His government rules over all governments. When his creation responds to his government, you see things begin to get in time. You th see things that aren't just a teetotal failure. Where are you going to learn this? In the assembly? You got to learn it in your local sacred assembly where some guy will tell the truth whether you give him an offering or not. Where some guy's going to do this, you can't make me stop doing this. I'm not going to stop doing this. The other part of God that George Washington knew was he's like a father. That's what made George Washington such a good father to this nation is he understood the providence of God. He's providential. That means he's like a guardian. So when George Washington took the last handful of troops, 2,400 of them on Christmas Day, 1776, and he took them across the Delaware River over to Trenton to a bunch of Haitian soldiers over there, and, they, and, he, and he's down to 2,400, and he's fixing to be down to 1,200 in a week, and the Revolutionary War is over. We done run out of guys, getting them whittled down to nothing. And he's sitting there the night before, and I can't remember the guy he's sitting with, but he's scribbling on a piece of paper, and this guy's telling him all this stuff, and he's trying to get him a strategy here, and you know that God is speaking to him, and one of the papers falls to the floor, and they pick it up, and he said, liberty or death? That's what he wrote on all them little papers, liberty or death? That's what I wrote on my little paper the other day. You see, you don't get to come to my house and remove my Second Amendment rights. Because I'm going to need them to protect my First Amendment. You can kill me, but you don't get my stuff. You don't get my freedom. And George Washington took a bunch of beraggled men with feet wrapped in gunny sacks and tore up shoes, and they head out across there, and it's coming a little snowstorm, and it's cold as blue blazes. Heck, a lot more than what we got going on stopped everybody this morning. Yeah, and if you're sitting at home and I hurt your feelings, you got the rest of the day to get over it. And they head over there, and by the time they get there, the water's icy. It takes longer to get there, and they thought it's 8 o'clock in the morning. They was going to sneak up on these guys in the daylight, or I mean in the dark. Now it's 8 o'clock in the morning, and George is going, what the heck? We're going to get killed if we go over there. We're going to get killed if we turn around and go back. And all of a sudden, the providence of God, which George Washington believed with all his might, he lived under the, under the heading of Psalms 91. He was the warrior who couldn't be killed. There are all kinds of great stories about the father of this nation. And it becomes a blizzard of all things. And they think, well, we're going to go for it. Well, them bunch of dummies over there at Trenton, they said, man, it's Christmas. It's snowing. Ain't nobody going to be out doing nothing today. We'll just sit in here and eat cookies and take a break. George and the boys snuck up there and got them. They killed them, a little batch of them. They gathered up 985 of them. They walked back across the deal, brought all their ammunition, all their stuff, and they're They'd been up for 48 hours without sleep or drink. They left a trail of blood in the snow from their feet, bleeding and cold. And these guys did it for you and me so that we could gather up on any day of the week, gather up in our sacred assembly. I'm encouraging the whole world, start meeting seven days a week because you're going to need it. And if you'll keep doing it on that camera one of these days, they'll shut you off from the rest of the world and you won't get to do it. But they can't stop you from coming in that door. They did it for us. And the providential hand of God helped him, just like a father. The good news of the day was when they come back and whip them guys at 2,400, there's 15,000 joined the army in the next 30 days. And the Revolutionary War is on, and these guys got some wind in their sail, and they're rolling. Here's what God showed me. Possess the land county by county. County by county. Here's what you got to do if you want to. I'm not telling you what you got to do, but I'm giving you an option. First of all, is you're going to have to gather an assembly with a guy who hears God that will preach the gospel. Because you don't change America by changing your politics. You change America by changing Americans. The other day when I was asking God about George Washington, I said, show me something in here. Show me. And he said, 
You're going to have to go back 40 years because that's when I started the revolution. In 1937, there was an epidemic. There was a pandemic going on in the colonies. It was called dead church. Churches were mundane. They were religious and they were dead. It was being reflected in the immorality of the next generation and they knew there was a problem. God saw fit to send some men to the colonies to preach. Men like Samuel Davies, Jonathan Edwards, Jonathan Dickinson, uh, George Whitfield. Uh, your most familiar would be uh, John Wesley. I'd encourage that denomination to go back and study him for a minute. He couldn't get invited to a Methodist revival if he paid for his own plane. I'm kind of my filters leaving. I don't have time for the filter anymore. And they began to preach the truth of Jesus Christ. And men and women became born again. They didn't get earmarked for heaven. They got born again. And they were born again by community and community and community. And it spread across the colonies as these guys preached Jesus Christ and freedom. Jesus Christ and freedom. Freedom or death? Which one? Out of that, the fire grew in the bellies of men known as the Black Robe Regiment. And they preached from the pulpits, and guys like John Peter Muhlenberg led men from the pulpit one day to the front lines of the Revolutionary War. They used this book to invoke the strategies of God to empower men to believe for the impossible, to get you up when you're tired and get you to go the second mile when you barely made the first one. And they preached the social issues because they stood for good and evil, and their people they wanted in office stood for good and evil. You already knew who was who before you put them in there. Next thing you know, there's a revolutionary army, a revolutionary war. Next thing you know, there's a United States of America, one nation under God with a constitution that says in its First Amendment, it does not address a church or a school or any other body other than Congress itself. That Congress shall make no law. Congress shall make no law. Your law says that all laws come through Congress. So there is no law forsaking your practice of your religion. There is no law forsaking your, or, or, uh, or, or taking away your freedom of speech, the freedom of the press. What have they done in the last 24 hours? Conservative men and women who have something important to say have now been wiped off your telephone. Don't think they can't stop you from watching this at home in your PJs. So make no law prohibiting your practice of your religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, your right to assembly, and your right to petition your government. When Congress makes a law that says you can't get together, they are now evil and tyrants because they are no longer governed by your documents. They're unworthy. They should be taken out of office. It should be done immediately. And the church should be the one standing up for righteousness. This Bible should be preached every day. Every day we should be gathered together. Men and women should become born again. This is not going to happen. The Great Awakening of 1740 is not going to happen by having revival meetings. It's going to happen by having the assembly where you go home and God becomes the government of your kitchen table. Therefore, becoming the government of your town and the government of your county and hopefully eventually the state of Texas and the United States of America. But some of this, just like that dad told his son yesterday, that nobody's invited me to Austin. Nobody's invited me to the White House. Of course, I did think one time me and Eugene were going to have to move there, but that's a whole other story. No, but right at home, county by county. We got it going on because we glean from our own. Your dumbest guy in Jack County would be better than anybody up there in Washington. You took them right out of your own people. But the church, the God's people, God's people, I'm going to quit calling it the church. God's people have disengaged. God's people don't want to participate. God's people don't want to stop what they're doing and go serve an office. 
Somebody asked me the other day, and I've got a couple of pretty good businesses going finally. They said, when are you going to run for office? I'm not. Until a group of people come and tell me prayerfully, just like they did when we moved to Muleshoe, Texas, to start a fellowship down there. We didn't know what we were doing, really. I said, when some people are praying, and I've heard from God, and somebody says, you're the guy to fill this job, and you know what, I guess... In the name of serving Jesus and might being a patriot, I guess we'll just stop what we're doing and go serve. I let Robin off the hook the other day. I looked at the requirements for running for governor for the state of New Mexico. I'm disqualified. Merry Christmas. <laughs> I think I could whip her and one arm tied behind my back. Set the captives free over there. Tyranny, you should go over there and some of you have been, see what's happening in California and Nevada and places where tyrants have taken people's lives away. You think COVID's a pandemic, you should see what tyranny will do. Over here in Texas, we kind of still run around and do what we want to because we're Texans. Most people are afraid to tell us what to do. In Bailey County, Texas, we're drawing up a proclamation that all men and women will be available to sign when it's drafted. It'll become public knowledge. It'll be buried strategically on the borders of our county. Men and women will pray and commit the land back to him. I'm drawing up a list of questions that I personally, I'm not going to ask anybody else to put themselves in a peculiar situation. I'll just do it myself. I kind of enjoy it. I've got a list of questions that I'm going to ask the employees that we elected to run our county and our city. i got a couple questions. What do you believe about my Second Amendment rights? Because they're inalienable. The Bible says it is God-given responsibility to protect your home. Our founding fathers said it was a responsibility to, to keep and bear arms because of tyrannical governments, not so you could hunt a quail. They made the Second Amendment for days like today. I want to know where you stand because you work for me. I want to know what you're going to do when they want to attack my right to assemble. I want to know how you feel on the murder of innocent lives when somebody wants to put an abortion clinic in our county. I want to know how you feel about open arms and open doors towards Islam. Yes, we're in America, and you have the right to worship however you want to worship, but your religion has been an enemy to Israel, an enemy to Christianity, and an enemy to this country since a long, long time ago. That's a fact. I want to know if you're going to make me marry people in an unnatural way that contradict the laws of God's nature. Or if you're going to put me in jail or you're going to sue me until I don't have any money left. I want to know what you believe about the right to my Christian faith. I want to know if you're for me. I want to know if you're against me. When I ask all these questions, they're going to know ahead of time that it will be announced from my pulpit. So be sure and answer correctly. Because in our sacred assembly, I want all my children, all my friends, all my family, I want them to know who's working for who and who's doing what because... We may decide we don't like you anymore working for us. We'll just get us a different one here in a couple of years. We're not going to be uninformed anymore. And we're not going to guess at it anymore. And we're going to do what God tells us to do. Why? Last verse of the day or last word of the day. I came here in 2019 and gave a word in January that said find out who's for you and who's not. Some of you were here. Know who's for you by knowing who you're for. For if God be for you, who can be against you? 
We're going to have to get on the same team here. We're going to have to bust down the Asher poles of denominational uh, 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 heritage and things like that that just come be God's people. Let's just be God's people. If we have to meet in a different place every day of the week, I don't care how you do that. Just be God's people because we got to get on the same page, man. There's not that many of us. Then I came back last year and I was the 2020 thing with the vision and I said, now you're going to see. You're going to see right up close. Some of that even leaked into 2021 before we really got to see a couple of them switch jerseys at the last minute. Now you're going to see the depth of depravity and perversion, the things that are going on right under your nose. What are you going to do about it? I asked God the other day, I said, all right, you've told me to see two things now so far. What do you, what do you want us to see in 2021? He said, me. Amen. And I said, well, Lord, what's that going to look like? He said, it ain't going to look like they think it's going to look. The hammer of judgment's up, and it's coming down. Sadie's seen it. A lot of people have seen it. Judgment is here. For those of you who've been tricked into this idea that you're fine until you die, that is not true. You are not fine. Those of us in covenant with God can look at uncircumcised Philistines and hit them with a rock and they'll be gone. Those of you that are not in covenant with God, you're on your own. God's for us, God's with us. His judgment's coming. His judgment's coming, but not just to evildoers. His judgment is coming to people who have pretended to be righteous, pretended to believe the gospel, pretended to know him, pretended to have ears to hear, and judgment's coming. You know the hardest part about judgment? I know a man should not call down a fire he's unwilling to stand in. I got taken to another place the other day and I stood with the angels of God with the sword in my hand as I prayed very loudly in the spirit and I knew that we stood to fight the fight. And I said, God, bring the judgment because I'm ready to stand in the fire. Freedom or die. We're going to have to come back to that one of these days. You're going to have to come back to a true faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're going to have to come back to the assembly. No more game plan. No more man-made atmospheres. No more monking around so you feel good. I don't care if you feel good or not. I'm fighting for my heritage. Death doesn't scare me. Persecution is the best thing going to happen to America. It's closer than it's been in our lifetime for any of us. So I'm just gathered up at the kitchen table with you this morning, kids. Oh, I'd love to be able to pet every one of you and tell you, go outside and play with your comfort puppy and just have a good time. But I don't get to this morning. You don't take land back? You're standing on it. Every one of you got a place of influence. Every one of you got a brain. Hopefully every one of you is in covenant with God. If you're not this morning, you need to get where you are. Jesus Christ has made this readily available so you can live. That he can govern your kitchen table, govern your life. That you can do this county by county. These are the guys that's going to protect you. Did you know that your sheriff has equal jurisdiction with state police, or equal authority with state police within jurisdiction? Did you know that there's a lot that you can do county by county at your local level that we can do this? Do you know that the church can involve itself? It can go... Preachers can go to stock shows and brag on kids and do things that you can you can regulate what happens right here in your own community and your stuff and the church can be an influence. God's people can influence. Because no weapon forged against you shall prevail if you'll stand up. Eugene, that's all I got this morning. It's just a little old talking and probably wasn't as fun as everybody liked to have and I didn't jump up and down screaming hog. Oh. How would y'all like for Steve to be your dad to sit with you at the kitchen table? Yeah. Some of them. <laughs> Some of them? <laughs> Not all of them. As Steve was talking, one of the things he said is that, that we've got to settle within ourselves something and, and, and that God's government is above all governments. 
that his is the highest authority there is. And, and in, if you look in the book of Isaiah chapter 9, he says in chapter 6, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince. Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. Amen. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Mm -hmm. Amen. And so he tells us that there is no end to the government of God. And in the next verse I want you to see that came to mind, he says that in that scripture that there is to be justice and righteousness. In the book of Zechariah, it's a scripture that I've used throughout the years. It's something God showed me years ago of where we were at. Steve is talking about judgment and about it, and I believe we're at that day and that time, and judgment begins in the house of God, and I believe that it begins with the preachers that sit here on this platform, stand on this platform. It's going to begin with them, are they willing to tell the truth? I was asked over the weekend if I would share some things with some people from other denominations. And as I shared those things, they said, why will nobody else preach this? <laughs> it's because they have not made a stand and established their heart to settle permanently. If God be for me, who can be against Amen. me? I'm going to share what the Spirit of the living God tells me to share, whether anybody likes it or not. Amen. When I'm told that I'm being too political, I am not being political. I am being a son of God and telling you that we must make a stand and we must make, draw a line. It is not by might nor power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. It's not going to be by political parties or presidents. It's going to be by, God, by God's sons and daughters Amen. listening to the spirit of the living God and obeying what he tells them to do. That is what moves God. In the book of Zechariah chapter 7, beginning with verse 8, he says, Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Execute true justice. Show mercy and compassion, everyone to his brother. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the alien or the poor. Let none of you plan evil in his heart against his brother. But they refused to heed, shrugged their shoulders, and stopped their ears so they could not hear. Yes, they made their hearts like flint, refusing to hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent by his Spirit through the former prophets. Thus great wrath came from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it happened that just as he proclaimed that they would not hear, so they called out, and I would not listen, says the Lord of hosts. Uh. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations which they had not known. Thus the land became desolate after them, so that no one passed through or returned, for they made the pleasant land desolate. I've stood before you for 25 years, and I've given you the word of the Lord, and I've told you that God said there was a storm coming. I've drawn a line across this platform, and I told you that there's a separation taking place. You have a choice whether you're going to listen to the living God, or you're going to refuse by shrugging your shoulders, stopping your ears, and saying, nah, 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 I will not hear. You have a choice whether you hear from God, or you refuse what God is saying. You have been Amen. called for a time such as this, just as Esther had a choice to walk in, and she said, I'm willing to die. That's where we're at Amen. right now in the Amen. United States of America. Amen. Things are in chaos, and God is calling His sons and daughters to rise up. Arise and let His light shine, for His glory is coming upon you. And His glory is His manifested presence, His manifested power, and His manifested goodness. Everywhere we walk, everywhere we go, we represent that. We've got a choice. We've got a choice. Amen. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. We will. Father, we praise You. We thank You for this Word. And now I ask you to give your sons and daughters ears to hear. Your spirit has spoken to us through a father that has set before us at his kitchen table. And he said how important the kitchen table is. You told us to go in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and other most parts of the earth. Our kitchen table is Jerusalem. Amen. Those in our own family. And we're to share the truth with them. 
We're to go into Judea, to that town that we live in, to the Samaria, that county, the state, the uttermost parts throughout the United States and throughout the world. Father, you told us in Luke that we were to occupy till you return. Amen. You said that we were to enter in and possess the land. Amen. Father, you said very plainly that those who wholly followed you, just as Caleb wholly mm -hmm. followed you, he wholeheartedly followed you. Amen. And Father, he walked with the giants mm -hmm. and defeated them. Amen. He entered in. Amen. Father, we want to enter in. Mm -hmm. Father, we say, give us that mountain. Give us the mountain, Father, that is before us. You have promised us, mm -hmm. and we say, give it to us, Father. Amen. We're ready to stand. We're ready to fight for it. Father, we pray for Jacksboro, Texas, Jack County, Texas, the United States of America. It is my belief that you formed the United States of America mm -hmm. to stand with Israel and to be your light mm -hmm. in the world. Amen. And so, Father, we still believe that you have a purpose with the United States. And Father, we ask that you deal with each one of us mm -hmm. individually. Mm -hmm. As Steve said, that he called fire down from heaven and said, Father, I'm ready to stand in it. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's a tough one, but Father, we want to stand mm -hmm. in that fire. <clears throat> Purge us, cleanse us. Mm -hmm. Father, I asked you years ago to break me and mold me into what you wanted me mm -hmm. to be. And Father, that's a tough place to come mm -hmm. because we know it's a prayer you're going to answer. Mm -hmm. And so come, Lord Jesus, come. Come. Thank you, Lord. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Yes, sir. Amen. Thanks for watching this week's message. If you'd like to partner with us financially or support our ministry, it's now easier than ever. When you give to Christian missions, you're sowing into people's lives and advancing the kingdom. Try giving online today by visiting cmjacksboro.com slash give.